Yes, guys. So let's talk about adjustments to CFS now. The first adjustment that we have to talk about is revaluation reserve. Your revaluation reserve is normally created when you revalue an asset upward or a liability downward. Whatever it is, you get a revaluation reserve in place. Now, whenever we are talking about this revaluation reserve, a revaluation reserve whenever we have in the case of a subsidiary. And this revaluation reserve is due to revaluation of asset upwards on date of acquisition by holding company H. In this situation when I am talking about the revaluation of an asset upward on the date of acquisition exactly when the holding company has acquired shares in the subsidiary. On that day, whenever I revalue and I get a revaluation reserve, such a revaluation reserve should be considered always as a pre-acquisition reserve. Should be always considered as a pre-acquisition reserve. It is always a pre-acquisition reserve whenever we are talking about revaluation reserve on revaluation of an asset upward. If that revaluation was done exactly on the date of acquisition, now let's say I have a company holding which is acquiring more than fifty percent in a subsidiary S. This S limited, which is a subsidiary, it revalued an asset which is having a book value of 100 to a revalued amount of, let's say, about 120. Then we say that. 20 rupees is the amount of revaluation reserve. And one more condition was what? It should be exactly that revaluation should be on the date of acquisition. Let's say the date of acquisition of this 150% is on 1-4-2014. And the revaluation of the asset is also the same thing. If they have revalued the asset from 100 to 120 upward, this 20 rupees which will be transferred to your revaluation account. Now, whenever we are talking about this revaluation, think from the other perspective also. Because for the year 2014-15, when I am talking about, if there was no revaluation, what was the amount of depreciation to be charged? Let's say the depreciation per annum is at the rate of 10%. Then what should have been the depreciation charge? If the value of the asset was 100, without revaluation, I would have charged a depreciation of 10. But since I have revalued, so depreciation on revaluation or depreciation on revalued amount my revalued amount of the asset is 120. 10% is 12. So I can say that, that extra 2 rupees, whatever is there, is called as depreciation on revaluation. This 2 rupees is called as depreciation on revaluation. Now understand the logic. 
I am saying that this 20 rupees of revaluation reserve is compulsorily a pre-acquisition reserve. That means a reserve which was existing on the date of acquisition itself. But this 2 rupees of an adjustment of depreciation is subsequent to revaluation. If I have revalued the asset on 1-4-2014, my depreciation of extra 2 rupees is being charged on 2014-15. That means that extra 2 rupees of, pro of depreciation, whatever you charge, it should reduce the profits of 2014-15. So what he says, whenever we are doing post-acquisition profits, deduct the amount of depreciation on revaluation. Now, what is the depreciation on revaluation? 2 rupees. The same 2 rupees will be charged as a depreciation on revaluation from the post acquisition profits in the year 2014 15. Because I am acquiring on 1 4 2014, my 14 15 will be a post acquisition period. For that post acquisition period, we deduct this 2 rupees. This 20 rupees of revaluation reserve, which will be taken as pre acquisition reserve. The main thing that you need to understand in this logic is you don't have to compare between these two. Directly take the 10% on the revalued amount, you will directly get the 2 rupees. You don't have to do 10 rupees, 12 rupees, difference 2 rupees, unnecessary. Simple adjustment is, if your revaluation reserve is 20, depreciation percentage is 10, then automatically my depreciation on revaluation is 2. As simple as that. Got it? Check this down. So yes guys, while this is the first adjustment that we have seen, the second adjustment is a simple adjustment that we need to understand, that is inter-company owings. Now what do you mean by this inter-company owings? Inter-company owings means holding owes the subsidiary or the subsidiary owes to the holding company. Let's say the owings are in the form of debtors and creditors. I have a subsidiary balance sheet like this. 
let's say on the asset side I have a debtor and the debtor is the holding company for 40 rupees let's say similar way I have a holding company which has as a creditor S for 40 rupees I hope there is no doubt in this because if I owe you 100 that means you have to receive 100 rupees from me so the same way if there is a debtor for holding company for a subsidiary company for 40 it should be a creditor in the books of holding company for 40 rupees now what happens whenever we amalgamate whenever we consolidate we consolidate by following a full consolidation method that means this debtor of subsidiary will also come into the holding company's consolidated balance sheet so when I am talking about CBS of holding company when I draft a consolidated balance sheet of holding company I will find something like this one which is repeating to the holding company itself that is a creditor creditor of holding company that is S for 40 rupees and when we consolidate with the debtor holding company 40 rupees because the assets and liabilities of the subsidiary are completely consolidated into holding company's books in consolidated balance sheet so what happens this debtor will also come into the balance sheet of consolidated balance sheet of H so this creditor already existing now this debtor comes into picture now what do you do? now what do you do one simple thing what I can say is now you can cancel both you can cancel both so what do we have to do whenever you are consolidating all the intercompany owing should be eliminated in full got it so this is one way of having an intercompany owing in the form of debtors or creditor you may also have in the form of bills receivable bills payable you may also have in the form of loans and advances so there are multiple ways where you can have intercompany owings if holding company gave a loan to subsidiary how will you see holding company will write in the asset side loan to us what will subsidiary record on the liability side loan from holding company so in that situation when we consolidate I am having one item on the asset side, one item on the liability side, both having the same value. So the best thing that we can do is, we can cancel everything. So, the intercompany owings are eliminated. in consolidated balance sheet in short we call this consolidated balance sheet as CBS uh, same thing So, yes guys, let's move on to the next adjustment. Intercompany transactions now. When we talk about intercompany transactions and elimination of these intercompany transactions, the first one, let's say, is stock 
That means, let's say a holding company sold goods to subsidiary or the subsidiary selling goods to holding company. I'll give a name to it specifically. When holding is selling goods to subsidiary, then I'll call it as a downstream transaction. And when I have a subsidiary selling goods to holding, we call this as an upstream transaction. Now, how do I deal with this upstream and downstream transaction when I'm dealing with consolidated balance sheet? I'll pick up the easiest first, that is the downstream transaction holding to subsidiary. When holding is selling the goods to the subsidiary, Let us say holding sold goods having a cost of 100 rupees at a selling price of 125. They have sold it making 25 rupees of profit. They have sold it to subsidiary. If for suppose not even one item is sold out of this intercompany transaction. Then how will it appear? Holding company, your stock reduces by 100. Your profit PNL increases by 25, which is nothing but the profit. You got stock is reducing by 100 because that stock is transferred to the subsidiary. And now the PNL is increasing it by 25 now. Now at the same time you also you also have a data here. Increasing by 125. This data is nothing but the subsidiary because I sold goods to the subsidiary. Subsidiary should pay cash to me. So you will have a data in place for, one, for 125. Now in this situation whenever I am talking about a subsidiary. Think from a subsidiary's perspective now. The subsidiary now has stock increased to 125. Because he is acquiring the stock at 125, he will record stock at 125. At the same time, he will record a credit R for 125 rupees. Now, intercompany owings, we set this data, this credit R gets anyways cancelled. Now what we are concentrating on is this part of stock. Now there is a 25 rupees of a profit which is made. And if the entire stock is left out like this, then we will say that when we consolidate, I will have a stock which is in place here for 125 rupees okay which is increased by 125 and at the same time I have a profit and loss which is made to the extent of 25 rupees but if you observe what is the cost inventory valuation principle is lower of cost or NRV but what is the cost here the cost of this 125 good is basically only 100 rupees for the holding company the holding company's consolidated balance sheet, I can't start showing it at 125. Because once I consolidate, I am treating both the holding as well as subsidiary as one single organization. So I can't show this at 125. This 125 should be reduced by how much? I need to bring it down by 25 so that I'll start showing 100 rupees of cost again. Now this is the criteria now. I have to reduce the stock at the same time. This profit whatever you got here, this profit is now called as unrealized profit. I have to eliminate both. Holding companies p and L. In yesterday's consolidated procedures, the consolidation procedures holding companies p &L was considered in step 7 when you consider reserves for CBS. So that place I have to reduce this 25. 
and this 25 will be reduced from stock when you prepare consolidated balance sheet in step 8. So what are the two adjustments? The first one, the unrealized profit on stock, the first adjustment is deduct from reserves for CBS. In step 7 and reduction of stock deduct from stock in consolidated balance sheet that is step 8. Whenever you are identifying the unrealized profit, unrealized profit is only on unsold stock. If a stock is already sold, then I will call it as realized profit because I sold it to the outsider. So my profit is already realized. Here I am calling it as unrealized profit. Now, just take down this. I will just change the figures a little bit. So the point that we are trying to make is unrealized profit on stock is always on unsold stock. Let's say the complete stock was sold. 125 rupees of a stock which is in the subsidiary's books. Subsidiary let's say has sold it for 140 rupees. Think from the subsidiary's perspective. Cost is 125. He sold it for 140. That means he made a profit of 15 rupees but actually when you consolidate and treat both the organizations are the same 100 rupees costing item was sold for 140 that means the actual profit per unit is 40 rupees now how did that 40 come into picture 25 rupees is the profit that holding made when he sold the goods to subsidiary subsidiary is selling to outside customer subsidiary is making a profit of 15 so when we consolidate holdings profit of 25 plus subsidiary's profit of 15 the total profit is 40 Similar way, let's say half stock is sold, then what will be the amount of stock in the in the subsidy now? Don't take it as half. Okay, anyways. Yeah, take it as half. Okay, there will be 67.5. 62.5. five of the stock will be left out. If this is the value of the closing stock in subsidiary, 62.5, how much of the stock reserve will you cancel? Whatever is the profit on the 62.5, how will you calculate? If the profit was 25% on cost, 100 and 125, 25 rupees is the profit on cost. How much is it on selling price? 25 rupees profit on selling price is 25 by 125 into 100. That is nothing but 20%. So how much is the unrealized profit on the closing stock? 20% profit on 62.5 of stock. So my unrealized profit will be how much? 
20% is into 2, Yes, guys, so the easiest way of calculating unrealized profit is unsold stock into profit percentage. On selling price. Take always the profit on selling price, guys. Because your unsold stock will be at selling price only. Your unsold stock in the books of the subsidiary will always be at selling price. So take the profit percentage on the selling price. So if that is a downstream transaction, there is one more transaction that we were looking at which is called as an upstream transaction which becomes really really important because it is slightly complicated when compared to the downstream transaction. So upstream transaction that is when a subsidiary sells to holding company. Now who makes the profit? It is a subsidiary who sold the goods. So the subsidiary should make the profit. Be it a profit or loss. Whatever it is. So subsidiary made the profit or loss. So the profits of the subsidiary are increased to the extent of the intercompany profit that he made. Now where do you take subsidiary's profit? Subsidiary's reserves should always be analyzed in step 3. Now when we analyze the reserves, here itself we have an unrealized profit. So the best thing that we can do is the subsidiary's reserves include unrealized profit. Your computation of unrealized profit will not change. Your unrealized profit always computation will be by this method. Unrealized or uh, unsold stock into profit percentage is the same formula that we use even here. But now the unrealized profit is in the books of subsidiary. So whenever S, S limited reserve includes the unrealized profit, 
So in step 3, that is analysis of reserves of subsidiary, subsidiary reserves with respect to WRT, date of acquisition, deduct unrealized profit on stock only from post acquisition profits. Now specifically I am putting this as post acquisition reserves. That means any transaction that happened before the acquisition between holding and subsidiary, you don't have to adjust. My adjustment is only for those transactions which happened between the subsidiary and holding company after the date of acquisition. Now, will the date be given in the question? Not necessarily. Not at all necessary. He might just say that, you know, holding companies closing stock includes so much of amount of stock which is transferred from subsidiary at a particular amount of profit. Now, understand, by the sentence itself, you can't say, simply write an adjustment saying that, you know, the subsidiary has sold, I am assuming that the subsidiary sold the stock prior to the date of acquisition and leave it. That is not possible. Because when something is given to you, he wants you to make a particular adjustment. So, always we'll assume that a transaction is after the date of acquisition itself. If after the date of acquisition it is there, then my adjustment goes on like this. Got it? So, always assume that the transaction is post acquisition. Unless otherwise specified. So what are we trying to prove? If such a transaction has occurred prior to the date of acquisition, then we don't have to make an adjustment for unrealized profit at all. If transaction occurs prior to the date of acquisition, no adjustment is necessary. So guys, if the question is silent, I'll always assume it as transaction to occur after the date of acquisition only. Always, if there is nothing given in the question, then it should be an adjustment from post acquisition profits. Got it?
Yes, guys, while this is the adjustment that is necessary that we have you know, to do whenever it is a down, you know, upstream transaction for an intercompany transaction. Though this is the entry, the transaction adjustment, let's understand the impact of that adjustment. Let's say uh, your subsidiary sold goods to holding company. <clears throat> A part of the stock was sold, a part was unsold, whatever it was. <coughs> I have understood that my unrealized profit on the sale of such stock was 50%, let's say. Out of this subsidiary, let's say 60% is held by holding company and the balance 40% was held by non-controlling interest or we also call them as Minority, because we don't know who it is, we call him as minority interest. <coughs> now, 50 rupees is the amount of unrealized profit which is made. Now, if I bifurcate it, unrealized profit also has holding and minority share. Holding company share in unrealized profit of 50 is 60%, that is 30. Minority interest share is 40% of 50, that is 20. Now, where is the adjustment from? Post acquisition profits. Holding companies post acquisition profits or holding companies share in the post acquisition profits of subsidiary. This 30 rupees, yesterday when we have seen the distribution table, we had pre acquisition profits and post acquisition profits, holding company share and minority interest share. Holding company share in pre acquisition profits, we have taken it in cost of control, that is step 4. Step 5. Then next, when we are talking about holding company share in the post acquisition profits, we consider that in step 7, that is reserves for CBS. So that means this 30 rupees is a share in the post acquisition profits, which will be considered in step 7 as a deduction from step 7. That means your reserves for CBS fall only to the extent of 30, not to the extent of 50. Then where is the other adjustment? The other adjustment is minority interest. Minority interest, be it pre-acquisition profits or post-acquisition profits, we were considering it in computation of minority interest share. Minority interest share in step 6, we reduce this part. Now if you observe in the consolidated balance sheet, if you take up, my reserve is reducing, reserves for CBS is reduced by 30 my minority interest is reduced by 20. My stock on the asset side should be reduced by 50. Observe balance sheet tallies again. Because the adjustment on the liability side and the asset side, both is absolutely the same. And understand, I have reduced the minority interest because minority is nothing but a share in the net assets of the subsidiary. So, his share in the net assets of the subsidiary, if I am reducing the stock by 50, then the net asset also includes stock. If stock reduces, net asset also reduces. So if net asset reduced, minority share in the net assets also reduces. So to the extent of only his share in unrealized profit, I'll reduce the minority interest as well. So whatever profit the sub, you know, holding company has in the, in the profit of the subsidiary, since he made an investment, whatever profit the subsidiary makes, it will be taken 60% as holding company share. Out of that profit, 50 rupees is unrealized profit. So my 60% of that is 30 rupees, which will be reduced from my profit as well. But this is only the understanding the impact. The adjustment that you have to do is only this much. That's it. There's only understanding the impact of such adjustment.
Yes, guys, let's go for the next adjustment. Put on a heading bonus. I'm not bothered about bonus of the holding company. I'm bothered about the bonus when it is given by the subsidiary. Now, what is bonus? Bonus also means capitalization of reserves. When I say capitalization of reserve, it means my reserve is getting converted into capital. So my bonus normally I am declaring out of my accumulated reserves. My accumulated reserves will get consolidated into the form of capital. That is the reason why we give it a name as capitalization of reserve. So whenever there is a bonus, the impact on the balance sheet will be simple. That my share capital will increase and my reserve and surplus will reduce to the same extent in the balance sheet. That is your impact. Now let us say the similar situation happened and such bonus was given by the subsidiary S. Now think from the impact of consolidation. How it will have an impact on consolidation. Both in deciding your holding as well as minority interest. Now whenever the share capital reduce. Whenever a bonus is given. The first thing adjustment is. Reserves and surplus is being reduced. This is the first adjustment. Already the reserves are going down. What is the second adjustment that I have to think about? The share capital is increasing. Now, where do you consider share capital? Share capital, we say that it is split into two parts. Let's say I have a share capital of subsidiary. is split into two parts. This share capital of a subsidiary to the extent it is held by holding company, to the extent it is held by minority interest. Where do you take share capital of subsidiary? To the extent of holding company share, we take it in determining our cost of control. In step 5, minority interest, we consider in computation of minority interest or liability of minority interest. In step 6. Let's understand the impact of it. First thing, remember one logic always to understand the impact. Bonus is always assumed to be paid out of Pre-acquisition reserves. It doesn't look unrealistic when I say this. Because what you pay out of the current year profits is dividend. What you pay out of accumulated profits of the previous years is called as bonus. Because out of the previous year profits are not supposed to pay dividend. So what do I pay? Instead of dividend, we are remunerating him in the form of bonus shares. So always I'll assume that the bonus is paid out of the pre-acquisition reserves of subsidiary company S. Now let's understand the impact of it. When I take up cost of control, see or see that is on step 5. What do we compare? We compare cost of investments. We compare this with Share in net assets of subsidiary. And normally we can say net assets is nothing but assets minus outside liabilities or I can also say share capital plus reserves. So when I talk about share in net assets of subsidiary of the holding company, then I can also put this as share in share capital. 
प्लस होल्डिंग कंपनी शेयर इन प्री एक्विजिशन रिजर्व होल्डिंग कंपनी शेयर इन पोस्ट एक्विजिशन रिजर्व वुड बी कंसिडर्ड इन रिजर्व फॉर सीबीएस नॉट हियर सो वेन यू कंपेयर दीज टू आइटम्स वील अराइव एट समथिंग कॉल्ड एज गुडविल और कैपिटल रिजर्व now let's understand the impact if i am saying that always a bonus is assumed to be paid out of pre acquisition reserves what happens when a bonus is paid what happens share capital increases from where it is paid out it is paid out of pre acquisition reserves so if i am paying out of pre acquisition reserves pre acquisition reserves fall so what is the impact on goodwill nothing so there will not be any impact as far as goodwill is concerned but i'm talking about the assets sorry your bonus being paid out of pre acquisition reserves if the bonus is paid out of pre acquisition reserves my goodwill or capital reserve what it was prior to the bonus will be the same value after the bonus because the increase in the share capital will nullify the decline in the amount of pre acquisition reserves because it is just the reallocation of reserves into capital so it does not make any impact as far as the goodwill is concerned think from minority interest perspective now come on how do you calculate minority interest minority interest is minority interest share in the net assets of subsidiary now share in net assets of subsidiary we normally don't go by assets minus outside liabilities we go from share capital plus reserve so minority interest share in the net assets is written as share in share capital minority interest share in the share capital and minority interest share in reserves when i talk about minority interest share in reserves either it can be a pre acquisition reserve or a post acquisition reserve doesn't make any impact as far as the minority is concerned and this will be my total minority interest now let's understand if the bonus is paid out of pre acquisition reserves like we have made an assumption saying that it is always assumed to be paid out of pre acquisition reserves now let's think about it pre acquisition reserve falls share capital increases what is the impact on minority interest nil again there will not be any impact as far as the minority interest is concerned or the goodwill or capital reserve is concerned when you are taking when you are making the assumption that your bonus is paid out of pre acquisition reserves i know there might be a situation you might say that you know what if there is a case if it is paid out of post acquisition reserves i'll come to that okay let's say that there was no pre acquisition reserve out of the post acquisition reserves which are earned after the date of acquisition itself the bonus was paid and the question has been very clear saying that the bonus is paid out of pre acquisition or post acquisition reserve if nothing is given i'll go with the same assumption but if there is something given saying that it is paid out of post acquisition reserve he is being very specific about it then i'll do this way so when bonus is paid out of post acquisition reserves now understand the impact where is the impact line it is paid out of post acquisition reserves post acquisition reserves reduce share capital increases so when it is coming this way talk about your cost of control again that is your step 5 again same thing cost of investment which has nothing to do with it i'll compare this with share in net assets my share in net assets include his share in the share capital and also his share in the pre acquisition reserves now will there be any impact or not yes there will be because 
your share capital increases while there is no adjustment as far as your pre-acquisition reserve is concerned because the dividend is sorry, bonus is paid out of post-acquisition reserves. So definitely here there will be a change. It will not be something same. Either there can be an increase or decrease. What will increase? What will decrease? If share in net asset is increasing, if share in net asset is increasing, then the gap between your cost of investment and the share in net assets is also either widening or decreasing. Now think about it. Let's say cost of investment was 120. Prior bonus, your share in net asset was 80. After bonus, your share in net asset became 100. It increased. So what will happen? The goodwill what you got earlier, I paid 120 to get a net asset of 80. That means my goodwill is 40. But once your share in net asset will increase with the increase in the share capital, it became 100, the goodwill will also reduce it from 40 to 20. So the reduction is nothing but the goodwill and the increase is nothing but your capital reserve. So what increases is the capital reserve, what reduces is goodwill. So whatever is the situation, if you have a goodwill, then goodwill reduces. If there is a capital reserve, capital reserve increases. Understand the impact on minority interest then. This will be very interesting. My share in share capital plus his share in reserves. And we have classified the reserves as pre-acquisition and post-acquisition with respect to the date of acquisition. Now, what is the impact on minority interest? Let's see. This bonus is paid out of post-acquisition reserves. Post-acquisition reserves reduces. Share and share capital increases. Net impact on minority interest? Nil. Because both the reserves are forming part of minority interest. You pay out of pre-acquisition. You pay out of post-acquisition. Ultimately, reserve reduces. Share capital increases. His share in the total net assets will never get impacted at all. So minority interest always, be it paid out of pre-acquisition reserves or be it paid out of post-acquisition reserves, your minority interest will not change. But what changes here is your reserves for CBS. That is where we consider holding company share in the Subsidiaries post acquisition reserves. So in your reserves for CBS, when we start calculating, we always start with holding companies balance of reserves. Holding companies balance of reserves, we add share in post acquisition reserves. Holding company share in the post acquisition reserve of S, which reduces, that means even your reserves for CBS will definitely decrease. You don't have to bother about it because think from the balance sheet impact of consolidation, your reserves on the liability side is, is decreasing. If it was a capital reserve, capital reserve would also increase to the same extent. Balance sheet again tallies. Or Let's say there's a re there was a goodwill. So goodwill on the asset side reduces. Your reserve on the liability side also reduces. Ultimately, you will have the same impact. So a consolidated balance sheet will compulsorily tally. So these are the two impacts that you need to assess.